Well, I didn't know I was claustrophobic until I was face down with one arm up, one arm down inside an MRI tube. I, as many of you well know, injured my bicep muscle. I went to my uh, orthopedic surgeon, who was great, by the way, and he said, you need an MRI. And I had never had an MRI before. And he asked me, are you claustrophobic? And I said, no, I don't think so. Until I was face down with one arm up, one arm down inside the MRI tube. And so I go, and he goes, hey, we've got an MRI here, machine here. Why don't you get you put in? And so I went to the tech, and she said, here's what's going to do. We're going to lay you down with one arm up, one arm down. We're going to put you inside this tube. It'll take about 20 minutes. And so when I got on the table, she raised me up, and I was like, well, this is different. And I saw the tube, and I thought, that looks a little small. And so as that table began to enter inside that MRI machine, I noticed a couple of things. Notice one, it's pretty hot in there. Notice two, that my shoulder, this left shoulder and this right shoulder were both touching each side of the tube. I'm not a small guy, but that tube was really tiny. Raised my head up a little bit and touched the back of the head of the tube and I thought, not a lot of room in here. And I didn't know I was claustrophobic until I had one arm up, one arm down, face down inside a tube. And so as that began, all of a sudden it got really loud. No one really prepared me for that. If you've never had an MRI, bless your heart. If you've not, I pray you don't have to have one. It got loud and she began to tell me some words I couldn't hear because all I was thinking was keep it together, man. (laughs) And I began to sing songs in my head and recite scripture in my head. And I began to think about how many minutes had gone by. and, And all of a sudden, every second felt like an hour And then there came a moment. There comes a time in everyone's life where you're not quite sure what's going to happen, but you know something's going to happen. So I came to that moment. It was loud. It was hot. Everything was touching me. And before I knew it, I had shoved myself out of that tube and landed flat on the face. (laughs) The radio, the technologist came out and said, are you okay? I was like, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good now. I needed a way out, and I found one. (laughs) I didn't know I was claustrophobic until I was. This morning, I want to talk about Jesus being our way out. I needed a door. I needed freedom. I needed peace. Jesus says seven times in the book of John, I am. He says, I am something seven times. And in John 6, he says, I am the bread of life. In John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. And this morning, I want to talk in John chapter 10 about the two I am statements that Jesus brings. I am the door and I am the good shepherd. And it's this encounter with Jesus that we find ourselves in in John 9 leading into John 10 that I believe give us great message and great truth that we can, as believers, have no doubt. You know, the backdrop of chapter 10 is certainly chapter 9 and the encounter that Jesus has with a a man who was born blind. Now, he didn't become blind. It wasn't that he didn't see very well. He had never seen. As a blind person in the New Testament, he found the job that was only available to him to be a beggar, begging for food and for money. And Jesus sees this blind man, spits on the ground, creates a mud paste, slaps that holy paste upon his eyes, tells the man to go to the the, the, the pool of Shalom, to wash his face, and then and there, this blind man now has sight. And Jesus does this on the Sabbath day, a day where no work could be happening and certainly no healing of a blind man. And the religious leaders get wind of what's going on. And all of a sudden, there's this brouhaha taking place among the Pharisees that there was a blind man who can now see, and they have significant doubt. They doubt that this was the man that was born blind. There's no way that the man who now sees was the man that was born blind. In fact, they call him in, and they ask each other, hey, is this the guy? I don't know. It kind of looks like the guy. We're not really sure. Is this the guy? And they, they ask him, hey, who did this? And he says, Jesus did this. Like, no way. Jesus couldn't have done this. And so doubt begins to creep in. 
And some of the Pharisees says he couldn't be of God since he healed on the Sabbath. Some of the Jews believed that the blind man was never born blind. And all of a sudden, there is doubt filling the air. And they call the, the man's parents in. They say, hey, is this your son who was born blind? And they say, it is. They, they bring the man back again. And they say, who did this? And he says, Jesus did this. And eventually, they don't believe anybody. And they cast the man out. And Jesus hears about this, goes to the man, and there identifies himself as the son of man. And some of the Pharisees hear this declaration, and they still don't believe. And that brings us to chapter 10. Jesus is continuing to speak to the religious leaders about their unbelief. He continues to be a man who reminds them of his great power and his great character, and he begins to embark on a metaphor to describe who he is that they would have no doubt. Read with me in John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, the man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. If first you don't succeed, try again. Verse 7. So Jesus said again to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. And I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, Says the, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This encounter with the Pharisees... They're having with Jesus over the healing of a blind man characterizes Jesus as the door and the shepherd. And both of these identities help us understand who Jesus is this morning. We're going to understand that Jesus is the gate of protection, he is the way of relation, and he is the door of salvation. Here in verse 1, we understand that Jesus is the gate of protection. He describes this door. Door is mentioned for the first time, and the intent of the door is to be a door for the sheepfold. Now, I don't know anything about sheep. I'm a city boy from Texas. I didn't grow up with sheep, but I know this after some study that a sheepfold is rather unique. It's, it's usually within some rocks, or it, or it could be uh, an area of space that has thorns or branches that are around it. It is a place that a shepherd brings the sheep to, and it's got one way in and one way out. That is a fold. And often a, a shepherd would bring the sheep to a fold in terms of bad weather, in times where a predator was around, or at night. It was this fold where the sheep are closely guarded and protected. And why is that? Because there's one way in and one way out, the gate of protection. Jesus describes in in verse 2, the shepherd entered by the door, but thieves enter in by another way. This another way describes the crafty way of a thief. And Jesus helps us know in this moment that there is something or someone after the sheep. In a sense, he is saying predators are out there and they are coming. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes I, I get on TV late at night, and I remember being a young man, and we used to watch National Geographic, and, and the show was aptly titled 
the predators at large. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Some British narrator gets on the TV and begins to whisper on the plains of the Serengeti. And I don't know why they're whispering. It's not like the lion is going to turn around, right? (laughs) And all of a sudden, there's this lone gazelle who has no idea, right? And so we see the lion stalk the gazelle. And then the next shot is of several things we shall not discuss because children are here. But the last shot is the lion licking its lips. I I love when the wildebeest are at the watering hole, you know, watering. And the crocodile is there, right? And it's all still. And you're just like waiting for the moment when the crocodile is going to lunge out of the water and grab it and take it underwater. And then it happens and you're like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know, predators are around. The sheep are the target. And Jesus says, I am the way in. I am the gate of protection. Jesus describes these predators, if you will, as thief and as robbers. Now, who is he talking about? Well, remember, in this context, he's talking directly to the religious leaders, and now he's talking about the religious leaders. Jesus is saying to them, listen, you are trying to come to them except around me and trying to come into them by another way. But listen, I am the only way to the Father. I am the only way to God. I am the only way to eternal life. So I'm going to protect the sheep from you. You know, the Pharisees in their day thought that the law would save them, that the law would keep them, that the law wasn't so important that they were willing to run over people to uphold the law. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to allow you access to my sheep because I know that you're in it for personal gain. And you will steal and you will kill and you will destroy. You know, today, very similarly, there's a lot of religion, a lot of philosophies that are trying to come at us. There's a lot of realities that, that point to a false gospel, and, and some are, are rather crafty. The, the idea that there's a gospel of knowledge, that as long as I know about God or, or the church or the scripture or philosophies, that, that I will have the gospel. Well, that's a false gospel. The gospel of works is a false gospel. As long as I'm a good person and do good things and, and I'm not a bad person, that I'll be fine. And the truth is you're not fine. The gospel of universalism, that somehow, someday, we're all going to get to God by any way. And that's just simply not true. The gospel of Christ, the grace that you are saved through faith, through the blood of Jesus, the death and burial and his resurrection, that is the only thing that will save you. And Jesus says, I am that way. I will protect you from those other things that are coming to you. You know, it's interesting. The shepherd would sleep, not among the sheep, but the shepherd would sleep at night at the door. Every night, I I lock the door. I, I, I go and I make sure the door is locked. And we have three doors to the outside of our house. And I go by every One of them. And with teenagers, you just never really know what's going to be open, right? And I'm like, it's 11 o'clock at night. Why is this door open? So I I lock the door. And I do that to keep anything from coming in. I'm protecting my people. I'm protecting my belongings. I don't know about you guys, but I would never go to bed with a door wide open. That seems a little counterintuitive, does it not? It's like an invitation to a robber. Hey, come to my house. The door is wide open. We want to protect our homes, so we lock the door. Jesus has come to protect us from those who say there is another way, so he becomes the door. Jesus is the gate of our protection. And secondly, this morning, Jesus is the way of our relation. Jesus is saying, I am the way for you to have a relationship with with God. Here in verse 3 through 5, the sheep are, are staying in a fold, and, and a fold may be uh, consisting of several different herds. You know, if you were a, a townsman in the New Testament, you might have three to ten sheep, but if you were dealing with a herd of sheep, it's typically a hundred, or, or some folds would hold hundreds of sheep. 
And when it was time to pasture, a, a shepherd would go and call out his sheep from the fold. The shepherd knew his sheep. He had names for them. He knew their color and their shape. He knew their, their tendencies, their personalities. And the sheep would know the shepherd. He knew their call. He knew their voice. The sheep would follow him. Scripture says in verse 4, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. Jesus is saying, I know the sheep and my desire is for them to know me that they might follow me as I lead them to pasture, lead them to life, lead them to joy and to peace. Jesus' true sheep will follow the true shepherd because of this relationship. You know, Jesus as shepherd is a, is a great picture of the kind of relationship that he wants with us. You know, Jesus by nature was sent to humanity like a shepherd is sent to the sheep. By his nature, Jesus pursues us. Scripture says he comes and seek and save that which is lost. The shepherd is willing to go after the sheep. And by his nature, he leads us, leads people to the Father. And the shepherd leads sheep to life. Jesus is not in some temple in the New Testament sitting on a stage in a high back chair waiting for the people to come to him. He is pursuing them wherever they are in their sickness, in their sin, in places that we would never see a religious leader. That's where Jesus is going. You know, in Luke chapter 15, I love the story, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And in each one of those parables, there's a pursuer, there's a problem, and then there is the price. In the parable of the sheep, obviously the pursuer is the shepherd. He has 100 sheep, but one has gone away. That is the problem. And so the price that, sh that shepherd is willing to pay is to leave everything to go after the one. The parable of the lost coin. You know the story. The woman has 10 silver coins. She loses one. And so that's the problem. And I'm thinking, what's the big deal? You got nine more. And she searches diligently, the scripture says. She seeks. She works hard. She goes to great length to find it. Like a shepherd would go to great length and be diligent to find the one. And then the parable of the lost son, the pursuer, is the father who allows his son, releases his son to go and to pursue pleasure. But every day he's watching and he's waiting for his son to return. The price that he's willing to pay is as his son is still a long way off, he loses all dignity as a Jewish man. And he runs to his son just like Jesus lost all dignity by dying on the cross for us. There's this great concept in Luke 15 of these lost items and the pursuer having such a passion to go after those lost items because they were important. They had a relationship to that item. Can I just tell you this morning, Jesus desires for you to know him because he knows you. And the passion and the idea that we have as believers in the church is to be reminded that there is no other way but through him. You know, the parable of the lost coin, sheep, and son starts with a problem, but it ends with a party. They rejoice after finding their lost item. Can I just tell you that you don't rejoice unless you have a relationship with that thing or with that person? Jesus wants to rejoice over you because he wants to know you and he wants you to follow him. As we understand this encounter with Jesus, we understand that he's the gate of protection, he's the way of relation. And number three, this morning, Jesus is the door of salvation. And we've kind of skirted around this issue, but that's exactly what Jesus is here. In verse 9, Scripture says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He's simply stating, I am the door to salvation. And a few chapters later in John 14, 6, he's going to say, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man come to the Father but by me. Verse 9, he says, there are, I desire for them to go in and out and to find pasture, to find nourishment, to find life. You know, here it's an indication that sheep need to find pasture in order to survive. Now, if I were a shepherd in the New Testament or the Old Testament, I, I might have a schedule that looks like this. At dawn, I would lead the sheep out of the fold to the pasture to graze. About 10 a.m., I'm leading them from the pasture into water. 
I lead them from the shade of the heat, from the shade of the day, or excuse me, from the shade of the heat of the day into a place where they can find rest. And then I'm leading them back to the pasture at the end of the day, back to water before we go to the sheepfold. There's a specific reality to what a shepherd is trying to do with sheep to care for them, to provide nourishment for them, to provide life for them. Without pasture, sheep die. Jesus is our salvation. He leads to life, but only by him can we have that life. Scripture reminds us of this truth throughout the New Testament. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Scripture says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, There is only one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is not a door to salvation. He is the door to salvation. And unlike a shepherd that leads to life, in this moment, Jesus describes this thief. In 10, verse 10, he reminds us that the thief comes to steal, that, that he desires his own profit, that after a thief steals something, they usually use it for their gain and then they toss it. Doesn't care for us. There's no personal relationship. There's no empathy, but a steal is all, stealing something is all about their personal gain. A thief comes to steal. A thief comes to kill. Often in, in the New Testament, as we understand how, how their culture was, uh, thieves would break in and they would kill sheep to get back at an owner. Each sheep was important to the owner in that they provided for that owner. They would kill sheep in order to get back at them out of jealousy or spite or revenge. The thief comes to destroy. They would break into vineyards and, and burn vineyards or, or break into a sheepfold and, and kill sheep because they wanted to demand that the increase of that price would go up. If there was more of a need and less supply, those who had it would have great gain. Again, the thief comes for his own personal gain. But then there's this great contrast between the thief and the good shepherd. That the thief comes to steal, but the good shepherd comes to bring life and life abundantly. It's a huge reality. One destroys life, one develops life. One causes pain, one brings peace. One is out to hurt us, the other is out to heal you. Jesus is the door to salvation. Salvation from sin and from fear and from the predators and the thieves and the robbers. So I began to think about this passage over the last couple of weeks. I, I thought about this truth that a door doesn't seem to be a real interesting metaphor for Jesus. But a door is everything to a prisoner. I've been to jail. <laughs> Not in that way. But as we used to do prison ministry, I'd go into the jail system and I would be so surprised because it's not just one door. It's like 25 doors. And every time you get to a door, someone's got to buzz you in or unlock it and it closes. Every time you, you get to another door, they got to open and they got to close it and it opens and closes. And if I were a prisoner, I would have my mind on the door because the door means everything. It is the way to freedom. It is the way to be released from your oppression. And Jesus is the door. Certainly is an incredible metaphor for us as we have been oppressed by sin and temptation and the world and anxiety and fear and chaos and pain and evil. And the list goes on and on. Jesus comes in Luke chapter 4. He reminds us to come. He comes to set the prisoners free. Has Jesus been the door of salvation for you? Have you been set free from sin and condemnation? Have you allowed him to release you from the oppression of the enemy? You know, a shepherd comes to bring us and bring sheep to pasture. Jesus has come to bring us to pasture. And the question is, will we follow him? You know, the rest of the passage here in John 10, verse 11 through following, all the way into the, the end of 18, 
really is this great contrast between Jesus being the good shepherd and the religious leaders just being hired hands. That when the wolf comes to a hired hand, they, they go away. They don't, they don't want any part of that. And the wolf is able to do what he wants to do, which is to devour and scatter. The wolf here being the enemy, Satan, and the hired hands being the Pharisees and the religious leaders. But a good shepherd stays and a good shepherd pays. In verse 12, he reminds us of that devouring the idea the wolf wants to come and eat and destroy the sheep, but the good shepherd will stay. He doesn't run away. He protects the sheep and he fights. Verse 15, 18 and 19 says, I will lay down my life for the sheep. Has anyone ever been able to say that to you? Have you ever heard anyone say, I'm willing to die for you? I'm willing to lay down my life for you? And that's exactly what Jesus is describing here in chapter 10 to the religious leaders. He's saying, listen, you won't lay down your life for them, but because I know them and I care for them and I'm called to them, I'm willing to lay down my life. But my life is not taken from me. I have the authority to lay it down on my own, just like I have the authority to take it up on my own. So the good shepherd is not weak. The good shepherd is incredibly strong. So in that knowledge, we're called to put our faith in the good shepherd, that he's willing to stay and he's willing to pay the ultimate price for us. You know, the title of the message today is No Doubt. Chapter 10, at least the first portion of that, is to remind us that we shouldn't have doubt in his power. The end of chapter 10 reminds us that we should have no doubt in his saving strength to keep us and to hold us. A few questions for us before we depart this morning. When we talk about John chapter 10, this encounter with Jesus and how it should impact us as we understand him more. The first question is this, do you have doubt Do you doubt that Jesus can? Do you doubt that Jesus will? And do you doubt that Jesus ever did or will do? You know, doubt sometimes creeps into our life, and before we know it, we find ourselves questioning the promises of God. We find ourselves questioning the power and the authority of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our life. And sometimes we begin to think, man, I don't know if he can heal me. I I doubt he can make my marriage right again. I I doubt he can help my child. I I doubt he can provide for me as I've lost my job. Doubt begins to creep in. Jesus, if he can make the blind man see, he can make you see. If he can make the blind man see, he can make you see. No one wakes up in the morning and begins to doubt the glory and the power of God. It usually happens over time. And this morning, I'm just asking you, as you're reading this passage and and hearing my voice, to be thoughtful. Are there moments in my life or, or seasons in my life or parts of my life where I'm doubting the power of God? Sometimes the question isn't, can't he do this? The question is, will he do this? You see, his will isn't a matter of power. He can. I think a lot of times our our deeper question is, will he? And, And we begin to think about God's will being a matter of love for us. If he loved me, he will. That is bad theology. Nowhere in Scripture does he say that. What it does say in Scripture, in those moments of your doubt is that you can trust him for all things work out to the the good of you and to the glory of him for those who are called in Christ Jesus. And so there's this element of faith. Not can he, but will he? And am I going to be okay if he doesn't choose to do that, to heal me, to help me, to meet my need? And can I just remind remind you as we've talked about the shepherd that we as sheep need to trust the shepherd. He knows. And what we may want in a small pond, and we don't get, what we don't know is that behind the pond, down the hill, and over through the valley is this lake that he has for us. Don't allow doubt to paralyze you. The second question, do you lock the door? Have you found yourselves 
with thieves and robbers creeping into your heart and to your mind. The thief of self-doubt. That if you can just do something or be somebody or look better or act differently, then you'll be better than you are now. The thief of workaholism, that if I can just provide for my family, then everything will be okay. The thief of, of addiction, you're looking for that experience that will be fulfilling to you. Can I invite you this morning to lock the door? The thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. And when we open the door of our life to his influence, we are allowing those robbers to come in. And to pluck us from hope and the knowledge of God and his trusting in his promises. Lock the door. For students, there's a couple weeks left of summer. You're probably at the I'm bored stage. I get that. Take a media fast. Don't allow the robber in. Get off social media. Find yourself looking for a, a, not just a verse in the scripture, not just a chapter in the scripture, but a book of the scripture and pour your mind into that to lock the door. Allow your influence in your life to become godly as they go through the door of Jesus and he becomes the filter for what should be allowed in and what shouldn't. Do you lock the door? Third question this morning, we'll close. Have you accepted the pasture of eternal life from the Good Shepherd? Certainly we can't finish this morning without asking the, the most significant question we can ask. Do you know the Shepherd? Have you received the eternal life that he is providing you? Have you trusted him as your Savior? Asked him to forgive you of your sin and asked him to be Lord of your life. And if you've not done that this morning, is your day of salvation. The scripture can't be much clearer than this. There's two ways. One destroys, one heals. One leads to doubt, one brings belief. And my call to you and I call through the scripture is this. Let us be a people who've received Christ as our savior. He is one to be trusted. There are others that are false, but he is the one true way. This morning, put your hope in that, that you would have no doubt.